I want to um, talk to you a little bit about complexity, um, what it's doing to us as people, and what governments are doing around the world to adapt to complexity. And then I'm going to share some ideas um, and not necessarily promote them as good or bad, but ideas about how people are embracing new ways of working. And then we'll do some, some talking with one another. So first, um, I just did that. So first, I want to hear from you. So get out your phones. We're going to do a, a Mentimeter. Does that work, or do we need to put the big one up? Oh, I think you need to switch back, you know? Besser, yeah? Thumbs up? Got it? Super duper. Okay. Dann jetzt, Kino. Dann wir wechseln. Let's talk about it. Okay, let's go to the first question. So, uh, you can see above is Deutsch and unter, uh, English and unter is Deutsch. So, the Ärzte, and then I'll read under, um, underneath. So, what is the biggest challenge in ensuring children and young people grow up well in your area? So, I think you can see the options on your phone, correct? Oh, you do. Which one do you have? Okay, so let's go to that. Well, someone's answering that one. Who's the one answering? You're very special. You had the secret code. Maybe we go to the next one. Well, let's see what comes up with this one. Who's answering this one? Okay, there's a few of you who have it. Maybe some of you f accidentally went to the other one. So the first one is tight budgets. Then access, the, so the blue is tight budgets. The purple is access to quality education. Then mental health is in rot. Economic stability is in grün. Then Lila is getting the skills and support I need to do the job. So first is access to quality education. Oh, wait a minute. You imagine this would be a different answer if you're in Kenya, right? Okay, next question, bitte. Okay. Um, how would you rate the complexity of children's youth welfare planning today? How complex is your work? Super easy, right? Yeah. So extremely complex. Okay, I'm doing the math here. Not everyone's doing it. You can't get away from me. Okay, so let's take this as consensus that it's complex, yeah? Okay, next. Do you use innovative approaches in children and youth welfare planning in general? Yes, super innovative. We try new things carefully. Or no way, Jose. Nine, that's scary. So yes, more yes than no. Okay, next, bitte. How has exchanging ideas with others impacted your approach to children and youth welfare? So it gives me new perspectives. It's reinforced existing strategies. It's had little or no impact. Oop, that's bad. <laughs> that's the first one. No, it's one person. So. Provided new perspectives. That's why you're here, right? To learn from each other. You can look around who put number one. You can find them. Okay, next, Deputy. How effectively do you feel current resources are being allocated in your area? Very to not. <laughs> I wonder if that's the same person. I just wonder. Hmm. 
I, I didn't mean to make that one red, but it seems like that just worked out. Oh. <laughs> <There's an laughs> okay, so t tied to somewhat to not very. No one is saying this is easy, yeah? I'm not saying this is easy. This is hard, super hard work that you guys are doing. And I want to uh, really call out politicians because that's hard work, really hard work. Okay, next. How well do you feel prepared to handle new legal requirements that you all are facing? Super einfach, yeah? Easy squeezy? Not prepared at all? Somewhat? Again, the very prepared person have another drink with. Give that or they've had too much to drink and that's why they pushed it. <laughs> okay, not very prepared to, so you can see we're at that end. Okay, next. Would you define yourself as a systems thinker? Do you, you work in a system, you live in a system. Do you think in a system? Yes, but I'd like to be better. Absolutely, I'm a pro. Should we ask them to raise their hands? No, I won't. This is a really good sign, huh? It could be false <laughs> hope, <laughs> but it's probably not. Because people who work with children, I'm a former public servant. I worked for the city of Seattle, that's where I grew up. And I was a political appointee for a city council. And I oversaw human rights and civil service, uh, human rights and um, housing for the city. And we did a lot with youth. And I found people who worked around youth issues to be the most systems thinkers that I worked with, tied with people who did um, kind of planning and building. And those things often go together, right? Working with children and working in a complex system of uh, urban planning, right? Planning and cities together. Okay, next. Um, I feel like complexity does this to me. Gives me stress and anxiety. Makes me more innovative and creative. Has increased my emotional intelligence. Driven me to learn. Has helped me build resilience. And everyone has a different response. There's not a right response. It's just how you respond to it. Has helped me build my resilience. You are a resilient lot, yeah? Your work, you have to be. Makes you innovative and creative. It's one of my favorite things about working with people in government is I find them more innovative often when they're allowed to um, than business people because you have to be. Because innovation comes in constraints, right? When you put a box, then you have to figure a way around the box. So often you are the most innovative people. So mostly it makes you innovative and creative. Next. What trait or skill is most important in helping navigate complex systems? Oh boy, they're so small, I can't even read them now. Okay, I think I got it. Even my glasses. Okay, let's see. Communications, innovation, empathy, Imagine that's going to score high with this group. Systems thinking, decisiveness. Okay, so it's a pretty across the board. I just want to note that no one has said quality control. Next slide. <laughs> Next a bit. In a system which best describes how you think of yourself. How do you think of yourself? You. I'm the visionary thinker. I'm the quality control person. I am resilient. Who are you? Empathy. Empathy and systems thinkers. Look at all you empathy people, eh? Beautiful. And important in making decisions. 
It's not just a nice trait, it's a critical trait. Okay, it's one I, we do a lot of work on helping the next generation of politicians. It's something we really look for. Okay, I think there's one more. Or are we done, Kino? Okay, which are you definitely not? So what is your like, I'm definitely not that person. I have no empathy or I don't care about quality control <laughs> or communications. <laughs> yeah. So we have on the far side qu quality control, not so much. Uh, then resilient, then visionary. It's super interesting. I w I, can I be a little stereotypical? I, no, I, I would have thought there would have been more quality control in a German audience. <laughs> I know it's a bit. Hmm. Okay, super. Thank you. We'll switch back. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to tell you, and now here come the, the undertitles again. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about apolitical. I know in German, apolitical doesn't work so much, right? It means anti-politics. But in Anglo and American English, it means nonpartisan. It means don't make policies about politics, make it about people. Yeah, um, and we started Apolitical eight years ago, first off because I was afraid that people on the left of politics or people on the right, everyone I talked to, nearly everyone, didn't like what government was doing or didn't like what politics was doing. And I was very worried where that would lead our democracies. So at first I wanted to tell the stories about what was working in government. And I wanted to tell them from the people doing the work, the largest workforce in the world, that's public servants, what they were doing. Sort of not necessarily make you all heroes, that's not why you do your work, but tell the story about how you're delivering on democracy. So we went around the world and we talked to young people in government and old people in government and men and women and all different races and everywhere, and we said, what do you want? Like, what do you need? What do you not have in your day-to-day -day life as a bureaucrat? And I really thought, because I'm a smart person, right? That they needed access to great ideas. But first, what they said was, no matter where I was in the world, they said, I want to feel appreciated. I want to have a community. I want to learn from others. I want to teach others. And then I want to go out and get the new ideas. But the first was I want to feel seen and part of something bigger. Because that's why a lot of people go into government. And so that's why we founded Apolitical. We are now the largest network of public servants in the world with nearly 300,000 members from 170 countries. And our job is to simply provide a space for people to come learn from each other about how someone in Togo deals with child welfare and how you might learn from someone in the Arctic and how you can sort of not recreate the wheel, as we say in English. What is that saying in German? Yeah, the clack here, yeah. Now, how do, you, how do you not make the same mistakes over and over again? And I went in thinking, oh, you can't learn that much from other places because the context is too different. But guess what? There's more alike than there is different. You have to adjust for maybe people in Leipzig don't like football as much as people in Bremen, okay? So maybe football is not the thing, but it's still something outside that gets them moving. And so now we have this large network that they even go on vacation with one another, their families, to talk about why they do their work. So it's been an honor of my life to travel the world and meet people from Sydney to Kenya to... Um, Malaysia um, to Brazil. Brazil is our fourth fastest growing audience on the platform. Um, there's been a lot of political change in Brazil, if anyone's looked at it in the last couple of years. Um, and you can see that we have people from, oh, the map is gone, whoop, sorry. Um, we have people from all over. We have people from Chile, the office of the mayor. We have sustainability people in South Africa. We have advisors to the prime minister in Australia, learning development in the UAE, and so on, right? 
And what we find when we deeply listen to people in government is that the things that they really care about are often the skills and mindsets, which is why I asked you, because many of us go to school and get a master's in public policy. Who has a master's in public policy or public administration? Only a few of you. Okay, fascinating. Um, but a lot of the skills that you need day to day are things you need to practice every day. And it's not just, you know, about finance and budget. So the four pillars that we really work a lot on is climate. How do we think about climate and government? Equity, um, digital skills, AI, and peace and security. But I personally have spent a lot of my career in public policy and early childhood development, so zero to five, zero to three. So there's a lot of work we do in, in that space. Now, I think one of the interesting things going on, and we won't talk politics here, but I think this is being reflected in our politics and maybe in our election last weekend, is we have 18th century politics, 19th century government um, institutions with 20th century technology. I don't, I don't want to be mean to the Germans, but there's more fax machines in the German government than there is, I think, in all of other governments combined. Um, and we have 21st century opportunities and 22nd century needs to look forward, right? Need to look forward. And so we're stuck kind of in these old institutions with new problems and new solutions. And this needs to change if we're gonna sort of adjust to take the best of the past and integrate the best of the new carefully. And so I wanted to start off with meatloaf because um, Hackbraten, yeah? Good. Because um, there's a story I once heard about Hackbraten in Ulfen. And uh, it's a story of, sorry ladies, a, a woman makes Hackbraten at home. She puts it in the pan, she sheaves it in the oven, she cracks the door open. And her man walks by and says, for God's sake, why did you keep the oven door open? We have a climate crisis. Close the oven door. And she said, nein, nein, Mama, immer mag das. Immer fieso. Okay. Then, and I'm like, that's just weird though. Why would you have the oven door open? And she said, well, that's mom. So would they call mom and say, mom, mom, why do you leave the door open in the oven for the hakbraten? Yeah, because my mother always had the door open. So, oh, well, why did she do that? So, I don't know. We have to call Oma Oma. So, I get Oma Oma on the phone. No WhatsApp. Old phone. Oma Oma, why do you keep the door open in the oven? And she said, why would you ever keep the door open in the oven? Opa and I had a very small kitchen and a very, very small oven and a big pan. It was the only way I could cook enough hawk rotten. And I want you to just take a moment and think about what in your day-to-day -day life and your work is the open oven door. Really, I want to take you a minute and I want you to turn to your, your partner here and say, in my work, this is the Hockbraten Ofen door. What is it? That it's just, we've always done it like that. What is that? I'll give you a minute. You three can talk together. <laughs> you too. You too, I see you. You're thinking, right? Thinking. I'm going to ask for an example, so maybe you can help me with the mic. Got a good one? Okay, who has a good one? Anyone have a good one? Anyone have a good idea, a good hawk rotten orphan? Nay, do you two have a good one? Here? Yeah, do you have a good example? Anyone have a good example? 
Ah, oh, that brave, brave man, yeah? Here comes a microphone. Now you get to be a star. <laughs> and in Deutsch it's okay, dann wir reden so. Because I've got no idea what that would be in English. Sachberichtsbögen. Was ist das? Exactly. <laughs> um, we, we require our um, people work, for social workers to basically write five page documents if they want to have 50 quid uh, <laughs> for like some glue and scissors to play with children. It's, it's incredible. It's, it, it, yeah, it's just a terrible practice and waste of money. Uh, and we have no money, so we have to keep ourselves busy with these forms. Mm. But that's, that's the mm. only explanation. Anyone else feel that pain in the system? You Germans are very special people. <laughs> there are a lot of forms. It's the only government I know that still puts out job listings for binder movers. Do you know you have people in your government who take binders from one part of a building and they move it into another part of a building? Day in and day out. The only government I know that does that. My driver's license from Washington State is sitting in a binder somewhere. It's the only country that takes the, okay, anyway, binders. Okay, so I just want you to be thinking about so much of the changes we need feed the change. Not all change is good, yeah? There's change that can be bad. But the good changes we need, sometimes it's not about the idea, it's about the mindset, yeah? It's like, why do we do things the way we do? Just ask, maybe there's a good reason to keep the oven open, but maybe there is not. So, how many people feel tired lately? Anyone want to admit? Ganz mude, yeah? This is, yeah. There's a trend going that people are tired, and this is also not just because of long COVID. That is a real thing for many people too. But one of the reasons is, is because complexity hurts the brain. And it's true that almost all of us, unless you don't have the internet, um, are, are getting more information all the time, right? Um, and what we know, as you can see, is that it really reduces our ability to think quickly. This is at a time when we need to be thinking better than before. Our minds are really challenged. 90% of people experience cognitive overwhelm, 90%. Now imagine our children, right, what they're, maybe they'll adapt, maybe their brains will adapt, I, I don't know. And 75% struggle with problem solving. So at a time when we have complexity, some of you have big resilience, we have really hard problems to solve. And so what do you do about that? How do people deal with this in your life now? Anyone have an example of how you deal with it? How do you deal with this tiredness, this overload? Do you know how they deal with it in the military? You may not like the military, but do you know how they do deal with it? Okay, I'm gonna show you. And then sit down and we're gonna, can you put your hands on your, put your feet on the ground? Maybe you do this. How many are frontline with kids every day? Immer mit Kinder, ja? So, we're gonna breathe together because the only way we know, reducing complexity can be difficult. But what we're finding, even on trading floors and finance companies, people are breathing. So we're gonna do box breathing. Anyone heard of box breathing? Yeah? So you breathe in for four, you hold for four, and you release for four. Four times. Wie viele? Vier, yeah? So I'll help you, ready? You can close your eyes, relax a little bit. Okay, in through the nose. One, two, three, four, hold, and release. One, two, three, four, and hold. Into the nose, through the belly, not the chest. Hold. And release. Hold. The next two are on you.
last one. Okay. Does that feel different? How many teach the kids you work with on the front lines to breathe? So we're seeing this more and more in high stress situations. Um, I work a lot with different prime minister's offices around the world. Before big decisions, they're breathing together, not thinking harder. Do you get better solutions if you just... <laughs> There's a game that teaches you to relax that speaks very much to people like me. I played foosball for 20 years. My nickname was Animal. It's pretty competitive. Be some typical American, yeah? So I want to win, right? There's a game that the more you relax, the faster your car goes. Just imagine, yeah? How much of us are just trying really hard versus in these complex times. And our intention spans are really low. Now, Germans are really good at this. I, I have to do a little cultural funny thing. Germany's the only country I know when the sun comes out, what do you guys do? You stand against it. You put your face like this. I didn't know what was going on. I thought people were looking at aliens in the sky. <laughs> what is it? Why? And someone explained, the sun is out. <laughs> that happens a lot. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It really doesn't. I'm from Seattle. It rains all the time. We never stop and look at the sun. It's a beautiful thing. I go to doctor's offices in Berlin, and in America, people have their laptops, right? They're waiting for their doctors, and the Germans are sitting. It's beautiful. <laughs> how do you do it? So maybe you all have good attention spans, yeah? Maybe, how many people read books? Fiction, like, not just Kindle, but real books. Real books. See, I mean, you would go to almost anywhere in the world, and it would be the other way around. Good for you. It's much better for you, right? This attention span, because most people are crap. 12 seconds, the average attention of a human in 2000. 12 seconds, now we're at nine seconds, which is the life of a goldfish. So just think about this. We're stressed out, things are complex. You all have to solve hard problems for kids, and we can't concentrate. So I think I've just figured out Germany's competitive advantage for the next decade, looking at the sun. Can we build that into the next coalition agreement? Like, this should work. So it's a hard time, right? It's a hard time. And having these personal sort of how do you take care of yourself in the context of solving hard problems is important because you're not machines. You're people. So how are governments adapting to all this complexity? Some faster than others. And I'm going to give you some examples so one thing that has come in that we've, you know, there's always been an issue with climate, but it's accelerated, or at least most people, not all the people in my country believe it, but most people think that it has. Um, and so what they've taken, we're seeing much more of a center of government approach. That's even in systems that are quite dispersed like you have in Germany. You have a system of lots of different, how do we come and solve problems? Now this is in um, uh, Rio de Janeiro. So they had a new mayor that said, I'm going to have a dashboard up all the time, and I have data. I know data is an issue for Germans um, for good reason, and we can think and talk about that carefully. But there's a center of government approach because a kid's life just isn't in his life. It also has to do if the garbage gets picked up, right? And if the air quality is good, and if the transportation is behind. So this is a big trend we're seeing. It's a much more centralized approach to government. The next thing we're seeing is you all were a very special group. Um, a lot of emphasis on learning about how systems thinking works, actually stopping and really learning. We have communities on apolitical, and this is, there's two fast-growing communities. One is on neurodivergent people in government, so people with autism and neurodivergency, and the other is systems thinking, which I find really interesting. Um, the next is silo busting. How would you translate the manual? How would you translate silo busting in German? 
aufbrechen wäre meine. Also Wie heißt das? Silos aufbrechen. Silos aufbrechen, ja, das ist pretty good. Das ist good. Um, we're seeing more and more people in government wanting to get out of I work in transportation, I work in the environment, I work in education. And there's lots of ways that they're doing this. Um, and one of the ways that many governments do it is they move people around. How many people worked in a different, didn't work on children's issues one year ago? Two years ago? Three years ago? I know your hands would stay up. Four years? How many have worked in children's issues more than 10 years? So, so most of you, it looks like seven or eight years. How many seven or eight years? Okay, interesting. In governments, oftentimes people move around. At the city level, they tend to stay put um, a little bit more. So in Canada, we see purposeful people moving around to understand the different divisions more. They even move around and do something crazy. They go into the private sector and they learn and then they come back into government. Um, and then we also see something, and maybe you have this in Germany, lots of coordinating ministers. What would that be, German? Minister, die koordinieren. Es ja, das Minister, braucht ein bisschen mehr Kontext wahrscheinlich, aber ja, so in die Richtung. So, I'll give you an example in Ecuador. Anyone been to Ecuador? Ecuador? It's amazing. It's a really amazing place. A friend of mine was the coordinating minister for children. The, the prime minister president at the time wanted to really put children up first, so he brought this woman in who was really good at building relationships across different from finance. Where's the money? It's in finance, yeah? Across finance, across the environment, across education. And her job was to bring everyone together and build that bridge. So we're seeing a lot more desire from people in government around the world to silo bust. We're seeing a lot more interest. This is a quote that came from our site about thinking about your sphere of influence. So what is your role in working in youth and child issues to be the sphere of influence that breaks down those silos, because it's very hard to do things if you just work in your lane, right? You need to change. The things that I'm most excited about is the approach of much more multi-solving or co-benefit thinking, right? So you just don't have a program that's good for kids. This is something called Urban 95. Has anyone heard of this? This is a project I've worked on, I don't know, for 10, 12 years now. And you can see it puts the child and the caregiver at the center. Many cities around the world, so 95 centimeters is the average um, height of Kino's uh, three-year-old. It's the average height of a three-year-old. And instead of putting transportation at the center or parks at the center, you put child and caregivers and you make family-friendly urban planning, or you make um, services that are closer to transportation, or you make healthy environments. And I will tell you that mayors are running on this as a platform, and across different political parties are winning because they're putting families at the center and helping solve problems. So this multi-solving versus individual policies. We're seeing a lot of um, use of participatory governance Why? Because we're dealing with really controversial issues. Should we have a re vaccine requirement or not? What should we do about climate change? Um, this is on the end of life in France. This was something that they brought citizens in. Has anyone heard of citizens assemblies? Heard of them? They're definitely gaining, there's been a bunch in Germany. I think one on climate, a big one on climate. Um, I think it's really the future. This isn't about town hall meetings. In America now, if you go to a town hall meeting, it's the scariest thing you can imagine. Literally, people have guns. They, they yell at each other. They swear at each other. They punch each other. Um, who wants to be in those environments? These aren't those. They're, they're controlled. They're randomly chosen folks. And in Scotland, they decided to do one on the future of the environment in Scotland with a youth parliament. So they chose 100 kids, seven and up, to be part of the youth parliament that went along um, this process. And they picked a panel of, um, I think it was 10, 12 year olds to do deep investigation, uh, investigation. Then they put those together. And I am massively supportive of bringing more youth into the policy making process. Why? Because it affects their lives. And it's really, really important. When I was 15, 
I was asked to come in a group of five other kids to decide how to spend $500,000, which when I was 15 sounded like $5 billion, in my community. And when we came up and we had to learn and make hard choices, right? It's a hard choice. Are you going to fund this kid's program or this kid's program? That's what these choices are about. And I learned that very young. So the more we can do these participatory processes, you don't just outsource the complexity, you bring the community along. And I'm super excited. We're doing lots of um, work with politicians around the world on how to support these processes. Um, a lot of use of foresight units. How would you translate a foresight unit? Um, also foresight is a method. I have it, I think, in handout with wide blick. Also, for the Zukunft planen, strategische Vorausschau, genau. Yeah. I don't think there's one in Germany. Does anyone? I haven't heard of one. It's a growing trend. Countries that you would think have them. Finland does one for, I think they have as far as go out as, like, I think it's 250 years. So they do 250 years, 100 years, 50 years, 20 years. And then this helps sort of, instead of just think about public policy in election cycles, which there's a reason we have elections, you can have a much longer view of how you think about where things are going. Singapore, there's really great stuff. And you can even do participatory foresight and you can bring in lots of data. So you can't predict the future but you can have an idea of the different options so you can be prepared. And I can guarantee you there aren't more fax machines, although maybe there will be more fax machines in our future. Um, so complexity is happening. It may hurt our brain. We can adjust to it. We need to have good attention spans. And it's not just enough that you can handle it, but we need our governments to look at the open oven door and say, what is not serving us anymore? with the systems we have, yeah, to do that. So I want to leave you with some three innovation case studies, or I have a few more than that. So one is, and again, I know there's a lot of, um, how can I say this, um, thoughtful consideration about what technology should be, should be used when in Germany. It's a part of the culture, and I really, really respect that. And there are countries around the world who may be too fast embracing it, and maybe responsible. The good thing about being behind on digitalization, which Germany is, if you, I mean, it's really bad. Um, <laughs> I think the worst, honestly. Um, anyway, talk to me at drinks about that. I have a lot of strong feelings. Um, the good thing about being so far behind is you skip the bad technology, because that's like already gone. Like, <laughs> it's just gone. You don't have to pay for that. And, you get to look at everyone who has screwed up and not do that. The problem is once you adopt it, then it's going to take you another 100 years to change. So you have to build policies that allow for changing. And that is the agility that you need in the system. So this is one in, in Malta. Um, now, Malta is the blockchain capital of the world, which is why a lot of crime is in Malta. So blockchain can cover crime. <laughs> But it also can protect kids. This is the thing about technology, right? There, it's, it, it, it can be neutral, and it depends on who uses it for what purposes. So in Malta, um, this is not familiar to anyone in Germany. They had physical mailing of numerous documents. I thought you would laugh at that. I, I think I can't believe that I have to wait for things in the mail. I just can't. OK. Um, which is time consuming. And you don't always get your mail delivered to you. And by the way, people can take stuff from the mail. I guess that doesn't happen very much in Germany, but it does in other places. So it slows down the process. And part of our job in government is to move as fast as we can while protecting people, right? This, this pull between speed and protection, you must deal every single day. Right? It's, it's a philosophical issue and a very difficult one. So they're using blockchain to minimize these errors. And it's given um, greater peace of mind because there's blockchain contracts now. It, they cannot, cannot, people who believe in blockchain, which most people do, think it's a good technology now. It's just how it's used um, to protect kids and to move much faster. It's very interesting. I did a lot of work. Um, on looking at how governments move to technology during COVID because we had to. And a lot of adoption was done completely online. Can you imagine? Some of those processes have gone back and many of them have partially stayed. I think meeting people in person before they get children is probably a good thing. Um, maybe the robots will take over soon. Um, in Finland, by the way, just really interesting 
Um, we are, they think, somewhere between five and 10 years away from sheep. Well, right now, a sheep can be um, grown in an artificial womb. Yeah, does that make sense? And we think that there are five to 10 years away from growing people in an artificial womb, children. And then the question is, what does government do? Now, Germany would ban it, right? You have a high precautionary principle, but someone wouldn't. There's gonna be somewhere where they're gonna grow babies in an artificial womb, humans. I think this is really interesting, like if this becomes a thing, I spend a lot of time with people from Japan and Korea, and they have a declining population. They are like three generations away from like zero people. <laughs> and so they're like, ooh, this is interesting. How do we get more Koreans to be born, right? Versus immigration, which comes with its opportunities and challenges. Imagine doing child protection work from children born in artificial wombs. That sounds crazy, but it's not that far away, and governments are beginning to talk about it. So this is um, not as interesting as artificial wombs, but this is really looking about how to include more kids in schools that were being excluded in secondary schools. So high school is where we lose a lot of kids in different systems. I think boys in particular, because they wanna do other things we see. There's really interesting work being done on this in the United States. So they put in sort of a new system to do this, um, which is much more flexible basic education, right? Much more on the job learning. I really respect Germany because you have more systems that allow people with different skills to get jobs and not everyone has to have $100,000 in debt to go to college to get a job that you can never pay for that. But it, this system, and I put this up here so you can look more into it, has reduced dropout rate by 90%. I mean, when you look at something like this, isn't this something you want to investigate? You might be thinking, that won't work in Germany, but it might. Yeah, how could that work? Next is, um, I'm gonna skip this one for time. Then I wanna talk about what's going on in Allegheny County, because I find this really interesting. Allegheny County is in um, Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, I've spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh. And the problem there is that it's really hard, I'm sure some of you know this, to screen when kids aren't being treated well. How do you actually know that that's happening? And so you take papers and you meet people and then you take papers and you mail papers and you meet people and then you have meetings and you wait for a meeting and you schedule a meeting and then you talk to people. Um, and then 27, so they noticed that 27% of high risk cases weren't investigated because either they didn't have time or the situation changed. Um, while 48% of low risk cases were unnecessarily screened. So what you wanna do is reduce the, the screening for the kids that don't need it, right? Do you move carefully and fast and urgently? So they developed, um, and this is, can be controversial. Again, I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I'll show you the data. A predictive risk modeling that looked at, okay, in this situation, there's a high risk or low risk. So it just takes the screen of your judgment and you can match your judgment against this. So I'm gonna show you a video. And I'm sorry, the sotto titoli, the undertitles don't work on this, but it's only, we're trying to solve a really difficult, very difficult problem. So the problem that Allegheny County faced was that we get a lot of calls to the child welfare hotline every year, so about 15,000 calls. We have limited information on which to make a screen in, screen out decision, decide which of those cases to go and investigate. And we thought we could use the data that we already collect to support decision making on the front line. So the Allegheny Family Screening Tool at the broadest level is a forecasting tool. It tries to give an idea to a frontline worker, given the background history of this family, what the chances are that this child will be removed from home. The methodology we use to create the algorithm in very simple terms is we do a statistical technique called data mining where we're basically looking through millions of patterns in the data, in historical data, seeing how it correlates to outcomes, and then matching each new case with those patterns that we've seen in the previous data. Well, data is still the driving force, and as we go forward, it's going to be more and more important. The predictive analytics work is unique, and it's the first time we've gone down this path. 
and we're actually trailblazers in the United States in, in doing this. So when we first saw the call for proposals, we were really excited because this is something that we've done in theory as researchers, but what Allegheny offered us was the opportunity to partner with a really outstanding agency where leadership, data, and frontline culture is fantastic. I would say it was definitely an integrated partnership, researchers providing feedback to us, practitioners providing feedback to the model, uh, and remains integrated today. We're still looking at data, tweaking the model. It's been a really strong partnership. So taxpayers pay our salaries, and they expect excellence. They expect the best possible service, and they expect us to keep children as safe as possible and to keep them protected and, and out of harm's way. This tool enables us to do a better job with that. No one thinks that our child welfare system is making perfect, unbiased decisions now. We know that racial disparities, class disparities, and unevenness across workers is present. And so the question is, on the margin, can tools such as what's been developed in Allegheny County help to improve and standardize practice and hopefully make it less biased as well? People are used to researchers like us sitting in our office, doing our data crunching, writing papers. This is very different. I've had to go out to communities, including the folks in the child welfare system, users, people who will be the people that our model will be used with and explain to them in very simple terms and in very accessible ways what we're trying to do. So I think that's been the challenge, but that's been the pleasure for my research group. I don't know the answer. Is any part of Germany using predictive analytics on child welfare? That wasn't meant to be a funny question. Yeah, I mean, the good thing, like I said, is you don't have to be the pioneers. You can find them, I know this is obvious, and talk to them about what's worked and what hasn't. I want to say something that she said that may have um, skipped over. She said, no one's pretending that we don't have biases already as people. The data is not driving their decision making they're making the decisions, it's informing their decision making. So imagine if we have data that can inform our decision making that is carefully held and protected, that helps us protect kids quicker. And I think there's a lot of room to carefully learn from others about how to bring this to places that don't have it. Yeah, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, very inspiring talk. I also liked how you contrasted international examples and then your insight into German culture. Um, the Binders remark, wir haben hier um, ausgehändigt an euch Heldin mit Umlaufmappe. Ja? Der Binder ist natürlich die Umlaufmappe, so that is a bit of a joke that we did um, on that cultural peculiarity, I'd call it. Um, I had two questions for you prepared, but for time reasons, I would just ask one and then hand over. But Dann könnt ihr quasi Fragen stellen. Um, eine Frage hatte ich ja am Anfang gesagt und die möchte ich auch jetzt nochmal an Lisa geben, weil ich sie auch so vorgestellt habe. How do you stay an optimist in these times? What can you give these people? So I, um, I've, my, my training is in life and working and learning from people like you around the world. But my sort of academic intellectual training is in behavioral science. So how the brain works, how we make decisions. There's a guy named Daniel Kahneman who just passed away who won the Nobel Prize for this, Cass Sunstein. So I think about um, how we make decisions and what influences our decision making. And so as I've seen the amount of pessimism go up in our societies, there's a bird chirping. Um, as I've seen the, uh, the pessimism go up, I, got, I went to the research and said, how do we deal with pessimism and even more apathy? How do we deal it? Because one person that is a mentor of mine says, societies start in bondage, then they move to struggle, they move to struggle to freedom, they move from freedom to abundance, they move from abundance to apathy, and they move from apathy back to bondage. So. The research says, and I'm not interested in that, that step, three things, and I think this is part of what you do here very well. 
So number one, community. It's very hard to stay pessimistic if you're with people. People that you actually can talk to and listen to and co-create with. Second is joy. Not hedonism, but joy. And the third is a practice that we do every day in my home is gratitude. I think if you wake up every day and not say, these are all the things that is wrong, I live with someone who does that, and I've had to retrain him to say, what are all the good things going on today before we go to the broken dishwasher? What's right? What can we be grateful for? That can combat it. So I can't help it every day be grateful that I'm free, <laughs> you know, that I'm here with you. So we're going to end with a bit of joy and a bit of a test. I'm married to an aeronautical engineer. Germans are really good at engineering. So I have a lot of expectations on you. So on your um, chair is a piece of paper. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to write down your one word takeaway from my last really precious hour with you all. I want to write down your name and then make it into a paper airplane, okay? And throw it up. Eins, zwei, drei, jetzt!